Good morning and welcome to this session of Business Breeders, a live webinar series hosted by Goodman Group at Brock University. My name is Abdul Wahimi and it's my pleasure to serve as the director of Goodman Group at Brock University. Goodman Group is a community-focused learning and development services provider that works to support professionals, businesses and entrepreneurs pursuing growth through professional development certificate programs, executive education, consulting services and startup support. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to today's session as you take a break with us. This webinar series aims to provide 45 minute pre-deals filled with insightful discussions on timely topics that are relevant to businesses and everyday lives, which are led by our award-winning Brock University faculty and leading industry experts, encouraging thoughtful debates and keeping us all feeling connected all together. This webinar series is hosted on Wednesdays from 11 to 11.45. In a moment, I will hand the screen over to today's webinar lead, and that's Peter McTominay, who will lead today's discussion. Peter will speak for approximately 30 minutes, and then we'll spend some time answering your questions. Some of you have already posed your questions at the time of, at the time of registration. Thank you all for doing so. You may also pose your questions live using the chat feature, which is open now. And if you so wish to choose, you may also tweet your questions and comments live at GSB Goodman Group, that is all one word, that's at GSB Goodman Group Live. Now, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce today's webinar lead. That's Peter, who is the owner of a wine business solution consulting company, which specializes in helping wine business owners. Peter has 30 plus years of uh, wine industry experience, including 11 years in global distribution management and has sold wine in many countries. Peter holds and has held board and advisory board positions with Australian, New Zealand, South African, and Spanish companies. He has worked and as a publicly listed wine uh, company managing director and as a former chairman of Wine Marlboro. He has been part of the National Marketing Committee and board member for New Zealand wine growers. He has developed global strategy for some of the world's most successful wine brands, including Frixnet and Wine Marlboro. Peter regularly addresses conferences across the globe and has taught strategy, marketing, sales, uh, sales management, service marketing and business culture in the MBA program of the University of Technology, Sydney Graduate School. Peter, welcome to this session. Over to you. Thank you. Hey, welcome everybody. Good morning to our, and, and welcome to our Wine Business Bounce Back webinar. Hey, look, over the last 12 months, many of you would have seen this sort of thing. And, um, you know, I'm not usually given to using other people's material, lest I'd be accused of um, helping turn great ideas into a cliche. But look, here's an idea that's been around for millennia, and it might be with us for a while yet, that in every crisis, there is both danger and opportunity. But understanding that's not really much use, unless you've got the right mindset right at the outset and it's been my experience that in any crisis people will do one of two things either they'll freeze or they'll completely freak out and i've seen this again and again over the last 12 months i was talking to a distributor right back at the start of the crisis and i was sort of joking around with them a bit and i said oh, i see you're not buying our um, research this year I had the great misfortune to choose to launch our Australian on-premise product, which is the single most important commercial product that we have, right on the very day that they announced the lockdown. And he said to me, Peter, I'm going downstairs to retrench 85% of my people. And I thought, my God, he's not talking about, you know, standing them down or sending them home to do emails and phone calls. He's actually talking about firing 85% of his workforce. And, um, you know, the consequence was that he missed out on a government support package that would have enabled him to keep those people for up to 12 months. He closed down offices that were going to be very expensive to reopen. And he lost key brands that were core to his portfolio. And even when I speak to him 12 months later, he still won't believe me when I cite Australian Bureau of Statistic numbers because they don't accord with how bad things would have needed to have been for him to react the way that he did. Similarly, I was talking to one of my best friends who's the CEO of one of um, the state of New South Wales best wineries. And uh, I thought he was going to say, look, we're just wrapping up vintage. We've sent the salador 
the tasting room crew home. They're all busy um, making emails and phone calls and we'll see how we go. But he didn't say that. He said, Peter, look, we're down to a third of a winemaker. We've got a third of a person in the vineyard. I've sent everybody home. I'm thinking of firing myself, taking the kids out of private school and going home and hiding under the bedclothes like this armadillo. And I said to him, why do you think that? And he said, well, look, I've been talking to our distributor and people are panic buying, but they're only buying box wine. And I said to him, look, hang on a minute. You know, I really don't believe that middle class people are going to stop buying good wine. I mean, the people I know would take complete nuclear Armageddon before they stop drinking good wine. And as we've seen, um, good wine has gotten through the crisis fairly well, all things considered. And it was really a great pleasure when I was out at dinner with him the other night and he turned his phone around and he showed me that on one Saturday they'd taken 80,000 Australian or about 70,000 Canadian dollars just on a Saturday. That was good, but he'd for three weeks not really hit the mark because he just hadn't been prepared to scale up at quite the rate that he needed to to meet demand. So people I find are really good at imagining how bad things can be. They're not always terribly good at imagining how good and how fast they can become good and being ready for that. And that really is a key message here. You know, stay engaged with all your people, keep them engaged, keep them doing things. And even though it might be the darkest point in the lockdown, it's the work that you put in now that will really see you through and make the most of the opportunity when it presents itself. Now, I think during this time that the Stoics have really won or the staunch, as we like to say in New Zealand, the hard people, and it is a cliche by now, all the stuff about controlling the controllables. But the key insight here, the key thing is that we all determine our own reaction to a crisis. Things may change, but we control how we feel about it and how we react. And they're saying here, ignore people dominated by their own negative emotions. I can't ignore those people because some of them are my clients. And I saw one of them the other day it was the first time in 12 months he looked like he'd aged five years. And it was really hard to sort of hold back. And I had to very, very gently remind him that New Zealand hadn't really had COVID, but it got so caught up in what might happen and what might still happen, that it was really impacting him. It was impacting his staff and his sales and marketing manager moved to a competitor just because, you know, his outlook was so gloomy. And I'm not sure if this is exactly what Marcus Aurelius said, but certainly mastering yourself and aiming to be virtuous is a good idea. And I think rather than learn to move on, I'd say learn to run faster. If I had my life to live again, I probably wouldn't have waited till I was nearly 25 to go to university, but it did have its advantages. You know, by that stage, I'd figured out that the sun also rises. And I worked out fairly quickly that if I was to dux the program, I didn't have to be smarter than the other kids. I just have to wait till they froze or freaked out and worked twice as hard. So that again is a core message. Now's the time to be working hardest when things are quietest because you will get busy. Now, most of our consulting revolves around this idea that you can't really understand the wine business at all until you get that there are at least five different wine industries that have zero to do with one another in terms of the best way to grow grapes, the best way to make wine, the best way to go market to market, who the end consumer is and what they ultimately want out of the experience. This is a commodity business and about two thirds of all major wine producing countries production is that. There's the grocery business that everyone's getting out of in North America except Gallo, even Constellation have decided that's not really for them. And then there's the first opportunity for most businesses, and that is that um, person who sort of likes the idea of um, wine, but doesn't either have the money or want to spend the money, but sort of likes the sort of idea of the lifestyle. Then we have the properly wine and food engaged who've really become core consumer in North America over the last while. And then we have that person who would rather collect wine than drink it, and they're a totally different human being. 
So our consulting is usually about helping people understand what business they should be in. And sometimes it's about helping people make a gear change. Now, just to give you an example of an assignment that we had during COVID that I really enjoyed, this is a wine business called Elephant Hill, and they're in Hawke's Bay in the North Island of New Zealand. And that beautiful promontory there is called Cape Kidnappers. Now, if any of you have been to um, Berlin, you might guess that the owners are German here. Those panels are not glass, they're actually um, aged copper. And it's all designed to beautifully blend in, you know, with the sea and the sky. I got a call from the owner and he just said to me, Peter, things have changed and we're changing. And I thought, awesome, I can't wait to work with this guy. You know, he's got such a pragmatic approach. I know he's going to be successful. So we did a bit of the old blue ocean strategy exercise. Um, I guess you've heard about the book or read the book, Kim and Marbone. Um, it's, uh, I, I used to be um, global marketing director for Yellow Tail and there's a whole chapter in there on that, but essentially it's a restatement of Michael Porter's work on value innovation, which is really timeless and really important. And stated simply, we went through the exercise around well, what do we remove, what do we tone down, what do we turn up and what do we create? And we were starting with this, and you look at this and it kind of looks like the Toronto power set sat down at lunch and I asked them how they did this. And they said, oh, we just got all our staff to dress up and we took a few photos and, uh, you know, everybody played a role and uh, you might uh, gather already that I don't like um, cliches or stereotypes, but there's the ubiquitous um, woman in the red dress that um, we used as the image of the aspirational customer. And, um, you know, it all looks perfect in a way, but then you put your hard commercial hat on and say, well, how are you supposed to do a sales presentation there? How are you supposed to present around that round thing in the middle? I mean, all you can really do is give these people a glass and leave them alone with their thoughts while they contemplate lunch. And then you've got a few tables that have got the perfect setting and another table that is so far away from everything that they're unlikely to get good service. And so he just said to me, Peter, Peter, I just want to blow this whole thing up. I want to patent the expression, more wine, less dime. So I thought, great. Um, now don't judge too harshly. No money was spent at this point. This is just the first Saturday. They just threw some chairs and tables together and they started doing seated structured tastings. They took the outside and they did pretty much the same thing. You know, gave them a bit more spacing and put a surgery outside that so that they could immediately attend to people out there. And it was just absolutely incredible um, to hear what happened. Instantly, they got the million dollar business. We know from our benchmarking that a million dollars a year from direct to customer is the average for a small business across Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. And he said it was incredible by changing the offer and changing the theater, we got different people. We now had people sitting next to one another having a discussion around what Chardonnay was going to go with what dish potentially, not a dish that they were serving, but something they're going to have later. He said it was just wonderful. And I said, well, that's great. You know, you've immediately um, filled the place and earned the amount of money that you hope to, but what's next? And he said, oh, we've already planned that out. You know, we've got a Chardonnay re retrospective in a month's time, then we've got a Syrah vertical, and then we're doing a comparative tasting with Bordeaux, and you know, he'd met the whole thing out, and you know, I was just so impressed. So, in terms of you know, what are we doing with direct customer? Um, Accolade, who are the biggest um, company in Australia by volume, pulled me in a little while back and said, Peter, what is this direct thing, and how do we do it? Joking a bit, and then said, Ask the best question anybody can ask, and they said, Well, look, what will it look like when we're doing it properly? And I went away and thought about that. And really, I think um, the holy grail is when you've got everybody in the business understanding just how important direct and digital direct to customer is and the real value of it. It's pretty easy to get business owners and board members to understand 75% profit margins. It's not as easy to get them to understand that they might have to fully reinvest that for the first three or four years while they onboard the right talent to make all this work. And if I could sum up everything I've ever learned in my life into a single sentence where marketing is concerned, you know, it, things are perfect when you've got complete alignment between your offer 
and your core customer's most desired experience. So that's mostly what we coach people on. The idea of the Holy Grail comes from a conference that I was at where a woman stood up and said, hey, look, you know, just give us the Holy Grail, you guys. We want fully integrated systems, software and processes that, that, that we were promised 15 years ago. And all of you that have, you know, dealt with Wine Direct and, uh, you know, Black Box, stroke Black Square, et cetera, will know how frustrating it is waiting through for product, waiting for product updates to come through, that those things are expensive to do. Um, and, you know, I really don't like when people use three words when one should do, an integrated communication strategy is just really a plan around who is going to say what to whom using what media and how often. But in terms of the leading bleeding edge, while people are turning up to my webinars these days, it's really all around, well, how do we use um, CRM and marketing automation to scale what we're doing? And the real trick here is keeping the conversation as personal and individual and relevant as what you possibly can whilst automating um, what you can otherwise. Um, Tim Ambler has a book called Marketing in the Bottom Line that I particularly like, and there's a line out of it where he says that for small to medium businesses, it's all about having every single person in the business knowing and performing their role in securing customer preference. That is doing the right thing for the right customer at the right time with maximum cost efficiency. And really, in terms of our workshops and what we talk about, for years I've been using this image, and it's funny how suddenly relevant it's become. Maybe you might have to remove every other place sitting there, but you know, it's all a question of managing your theatre, creating the ideal experience for people um, that may just happen to involve um, a little bit of wine and food education and the possibility to buy. And the evolution of direct to customer, you know, it started out in Australia really as a sort of a sampling station, you know, where people would drive out from the city, they'd go to a, a kind of a bar thing, and somebody would pour some wine and sort of hope a little bit. There wasn't really any serious effort to sell anybody anything. And the whole idea was that they'd remember your brand and go off and buy it later. Not a very good model. Um, it was the Americans, of course, who discovered that you could take people's credit cards and just keep sending them wine until they beg you to stop. I mean, that's awesome, isn't it? I mean, what other industry can get away with that? But the big drive, of course, is to take everything digital, and that, of course, is happening. But I guess the leading edge where my customers are concerned is, you know, how do we move to a fully integrated, partially automated um, communication setup? And the journey has been about taking people from a standing situation to a seated one. We have a particular attachment to the bar in Australia and New Zealand, as you might imagine. Moving away from a product demonstration to a learning pleasure-based experience, and then getting people to pay for that. And the best operators that we say see work with um, a customer experience blueprint that includes a really good opportunity for people to um, join your commitment club. And we know that that transformation you know, from US data typically leads to six times the sales that if you move people to a private structured tasting that that typically works six times as well as that typical bar type situation. And that the prospects of getting somebody to join your wine clubs include uh, increases by six times as well. And we're always saying that any strategy um, really ought to be clear, focused, singular, and easy to grasp. But of course, the thinking that goes into that needs to be really sophisticated, that we need to do um, everything that we can in terms of making our website work as hard for us as what we possibly can do. Because between website and social, that's generally how people enter a brand today. All those old school traditional marketing things are still there, but they're going digital by the day. Then of course, with wineries have conversion tools like newsletters and phone calls, emails, social that they use. But for me, the real moment of truth is when there's someone from your company, a glass of wine and a customer on the other side. And in terms of our clients discovering that, um, this is Rollo and Zoe Crittenden, their father Gary um, went to South Africa at my behest, 
he saw how they were doing the whole hospitality experience and they got the result. They increased their sales by six times. And the idea at the moment of truth that comes from a book um, by a guy called Jan Carlson, very old book, as you might be able to tell by that man's haircut, but he was the first guy that, as leader of Scandinavian airline services, realised that it's not about you know having the best fleet or the best on-time arrivals or the best club. It's about the six times when a human being interacts with another one. And this is what I think Canadian wineries have appreciated perhaps better than anybody, that it is about hospitality. It's about high-end hospitality. And doing that as well as what it possibly can be done. And that is why when I looked around the whole world for examples of excellence, I couldn't go past Canada. It was really interesting and quite amusing, I thought, that um, there were two Canadian wineries that were the first Canadians that presented at the Direct Customer Symposium in California this year. And they must have had a bit of a powwow beforehand and decided that whatever happens, they can't let the side down. And they really gave the best presentation that there was. I mean, these guys put in 100 million Canadian and then COVID hit, so they really had to respond. And um, Puget is a reasonably common French name. French Canadians listening would know that. Anahita is not. Anahita is Indian. And there's an old saying, of course, that behind every strong man there's a stronger woman. Well, let me tell you that Anahita is not standing behind anyone. She's right out front and she's properly kicking backside and it's really inspiring to see. And the thrust of her presentation was that success during COVID has been about simplicity, clarifying and sharing through good advertising. And so what did that look like? Well, when they talked to people about what they could do, they simply had two choices and they were going to want to do either one of these two things Anyway, either they were going to have the full seated structured tasting experience that we were just talking about, or they were going to have a, an estate tour. And it's what I call the two card trick. And um, my cousin ran Oyster Bay in Australia for the first four years. Now, Oyster Bay is, as nearly as I can tell, um, the largest brand in the world sold at more than $15. And they used the same sort of trick where they said to people, well, look, what do you want, red or white? Well, you know, it's Marlborough, so it's going to be white. What do you want, Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc? Well, of course, they're going to choose Sauvignon Blanc. So the art, you know, when you've got an aspirational brand like this, is to give people a choice that, you know, only the amount of choice that they need to make a decision. That's, I guess, the trick. And when I saw this, I was really blown away. I was lucky enough to attend the last advertising class that was given as a standalone subject when I did my master's. And this is the epitome of everything that they talked about. It's so simple and so direct. You know, first of all, there's the big claim, you know, experience, experience the extraordinary. These guys had really set themselves up to be considered the best, or at least amongst the best winery in Canada. And then it's, you know, by appointment only and um, dial this number. So immediate call to action. And what I love about this is that this could be a business card or a billboard. It just works so beautifully as an advertisement. Now, um, what was the result they got from that? Well, people are always saying to me, how do I become Noons? Noons is this winery in McLaren Vale in South Australia who sell 3000 cases. They're open one day a year all their wine goes and there's a waiting list and the answer is you do exactly this you know with the promise um, that they gave and the service that they delivered they're able to fully allocate their club within a month you've got a 200 person waiting list and it'll take you 12 to 16 months to get on there and then she talked about heightening, deepening and personalising the experience and um, Icon Vineyards and Mission Hills stepped up next and I loved it when I saw this picture. I've been talking to clients for years about doing this. Why, when you've got a beautiful green space outside your um, window, would you not use that instead of keep keeping people cooped up inside? Why not? you know, look out across the, the beautiful Okanagan Valley. And of course, they had a very detailed briefing at the beginning of how people were to be kept safe and how they were 
um, kept separate. And they used um, a bunch of stations, you know, they had the glass station, the dirt station, the cellar station. And I thought, well, hang on a minute, that reminds me of something. And I remember when I worked for Freshenet, a very important brand in the Canadian context, we had 250 Australian visitors um, come to our cellars in Spain. And I thought, well, we can only fit 60 people in our cinema, so we're going to have to come up with another plan. So I put um, five groups of 50 on five buses and, you know, one was in the cinema, one was at lunch, one was at another winery. We keep people moving around. And, um, you know, people really enjoyed that. And then looking at the results um, that, these, uh, that Mission Hill got, they had to invest three times to get the people and to create the experience. Their orders were only up 27%, but the average order value was up 90, meaning that revenue was up 168%. Now, the accountants among you will be saying, well, that really needs to be 200. However, I very much doubt that these people are going to forget this for the rest of their lives. Certainly, the research that we did at Freshenet showed us that the single best return on investment you could ever make was on hospitality. Uh, and what about clients doing um, that we think is the best that's out there at the moment? It's really about using the whole reservation system as concierge, about interacting with people as early as possible. Um, we've even got clients who don't even let people get out of the car before they go and greet them. And, but, you know, if we're looking at opportunities that COVID has given them, it's to get that marketing collateral on the table so that people can actually start selling themselves so that they can see the price of things, so that they can see the price after club discount, so that they can see the club offer. And the real irony is that we've seen Five Star Hotel using this sort of collateral, and now they're picking those things up again and handing people out the old menus. And I think it's a real lost opportunity. Um, then um, we're getting people to implement customer experience um, blueprints. And that's simply an idea that all the world's a stage. There's always a backstage that you don't want people to see. And there's always technology underpinning it. And of course, measurements, budgets and accountabilities. So that everything from the moment you hear the crunch of the gravel as the cars come down the driveway to the moment that they leave with a trunk full of wine, you've got a plan on how you deliver highest quality service. So I think the best article that I've ever written, uh, read in my life um, appeared at the Harvard Business Review as far back as 2008, and it was on reinventing your business model, where if you really are clear on your customer value proposition, what important question you answer, you can then use that to re-engineer your profit formula and bring on the processes and resources that you need. And utilizing that thought process, what we've done with 60 wine businesses um, during the last 12 months is get them to fill this out. And everybody tells us that this has been extremely useful to really refocus on who your core audience is going to be going forward, what your value proposition is, what important question you answer. Therefore, what's your offer now need to look like? What's your customer experience look like? What's your events look like? And how will venues operate? Where will they be when you can start going to them? And hopefully we've seen an outstanding example, Canadian example um, of how to consider all of that and how to manage the change. Then we get people to map out their communication strategy and to think about how we're going to make it happen. Are we going to insource? Are we going to outsource talent? Are we going to get to put together project teams? And then how do we put into place measurement of all that? Um, well, look, that's um, my 30 minutes up. So I'll um, hand back to Abdul. And if there has been any questions, I'll um, very happily um, answer them. I'll just um, stop sharing my screen. Pia, thank you. That was a, that was a quick thirty minutes. You covered a lot. Of <laughs> it really is. <laughs> thank you. And I, and I should also add that from where you're presenting, it's actually uh, well, it's 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 one a.m. at night or in the morning. So it's uh, it's 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 additional pleasure to have you here. So thank you for uh, for being flexible with your with your schedule in that sense. 
Uh, we do have questions uh, that have come through. Um, how much of the wine industry and wineries are about the experience and wine gastronomy in your thoughts, Peter? Well, that really depends which one of those industries that you're in. If you're talking about, you know, from the grocery level down, not very much. Um, and and yet it's it's really interesting in a way in that you'll see these episodes of MasterChef and you'll see an ideal opportunity for a high-end wine brand to come in. And it's usually the national brand that comes in. So I think there's always a bit of that. You know, people always buy, um, you know, gourmet magazines and then you always see ketchup being advertised uh, so there's always a little bit of that there's always a little bit of ambition exceeding what people are really going to do but i think for small to medium businesses if you're making less than fifty thousand cases wine and gastronomy is so critically important and the big discovery for our people during this time is that there's very few people that are interested in just in wine and you know, very few people in any party that want to sit there and have a great long presentation about wine. Whereas if you can start talking to people a little bit about food, then you've got everyone um, engaged. And one of our best clients, Creation Wines of South Africa, they were the first to go down the path of actually selling wine and food education as a product. Their whole business is that. They could have simply made Pinot Noir and Chardonnay because where they are in South Africa, there's only about, uh, you know, six or eight wineries that really make good Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. They could have really taken the easy route, but they didn't. You know, they said, well, look, you know, we really think that this is an extremely powerful idea and we want to do it well. And they've got a great thriving internationally renowned um, business as a result that a lot of people have looked to copy. Fantastic, great. Uh, this next question is about the seated structure. So who do you think are the target or who are you targeting with the seated structure tasting approach, Peter? Well, I think you're, ta you're targeting anybody from, you know, that aspirational consum uh, consumer and up. I mean, this might be somebody who's always like wine, always been a little bit interested in, in wine and now gets the opportunity to find out a little bit more principally you're targeting that person that's engaged with wine, food and travel. And that's a, you know, a, a solid block of consumers. Um, you know, for example, the Wine Market Council in the US um, found that the largest segment of engaged consumers, 36%, were already spending over $20 a bottle um, as far back as 2016. Um, so in terms of who's going, they're important. But look, the last um, wine tasting trip I went on, we were nine and I was really the only person there that was that interested in just doing the wine tasting. And it had a, a really transformative effect because we went to one place that clearly had the best wine in the whole region and people sort of sat through the tasting and they quite enjoyed it you know it was sort of moderately okay and then we went to a, a full um you know paired tasting experience and it was just tiny little morsels and it, it wasn't a restaurant and it wasn't expensive to deliver i then asked the group afterwards who made the best wine and they unanimously voted for the people that did the paired tasting experience so there's real power in that educative piece. And it doesn't have to be around wine and food. I know a guy who sold a million dollars worth of wine in one year with no cellar door. <laughs> he just had a plan where he had a you know chalkboard at the local motel and said, well, look, if you want to go wine tasting, I'll come and collect you. I'll entertain you for the day. I'll feed you and I'll bring you home at the end of it. So rather than the tour company doing that, it was a message from the owner. And he just walked around the vineyard. He just talked about his life. He'd go into the shed and get a pipette and pour something in a glass. And, you know, it, by, the, by the time we got to have a conversation about it being about time that they got a, a tasting room, uh, he was already selling a million dollars a year in wine direct. So it's it's the interaction, it's the education, it's the you know, getting, and sometimes it's just getting closer to the earth. I mean, when I asked the panel of sommelier, what would um, make them more likely than anything else to list somebody's wine? They said, well, it was, it would be, you know, being in the vineyard with the people that make the wine, actually 
you know, touching the dirt. You know, Michel Chaputier in the Rhone Valley actually gets people to lick stones. Um, so, um, it, you know, th there's a lot of different ways that you can implement the educative element to it all. Food just happens to be the most logical because everybody eats and everybody's getting to enjoy a bit of food. Mm -hmm. oh, that, that sounds like a wonderful sort of trip and lunch where you end up selling over a million dollars in the process. So that's a... <laughs> Yeah. Sure. <laughs> um, in uh, take, keeping in mind of small and medium sized wineries who may not have a large enough space for seating tasting, um, mm. how would you advise them in um, what strategies could they deploy to try and offer the same experience to their customers? Um, well, look, I think this has to be handled very um, carefully. You know, if you listen to the marketing management at Chateau Montalena, you know, the guys from uh, Bottle Shock at the Judgment of Paris, etc., they really love having sort of, you know, the last customers they feel walking in and then getting a couple of planks and a couple of barrels and doing an impromptu tasting and then people feel really special. Um, but I noticed something um, that... Um, you know, disturbed me a little bit. I went to this wine region and I'd been given the task of going to all 18 wineries and they'd all copied one another, but they're all basically making the same mistake uh, or three mistakes that so they weren't charging or they weren't charging enough. They were tasting the whole range. So they were all tasting, you know, up to 10 or 15 wines. Um, and they had thought, well, you know, we've got a quick solution given that we haven't got a lot of space. We've got lots of barrels, so we'll get people sat around a barrel. And that's a horrible idea, you know, because no one over 40 should sit on a bar stool and there's not really any room at all on top of a barrel. Um, so I would say, don't do that. What I'd say is, you know, as we've been um, referencing all the way through, make the most of your green space outside. I mean, some of the cleverest of my clients, um, you know, prior to COVID used to put um, bean bags out on the lawn so that when they've done everything, so that when they've tasted the wine and had lunch, they could still sit there and enjoy a glass and uh, enjoy looking at their biodynamic vineyard. <laughs> Um, and after five minutes of that, you'd have no trouble imagining where quality comes from at that producer's place. So, you know, and, and it's a weird thing because you'd think that the longer people would sit, stay, the less they'd buy. But typically, the longer people stay, the more they buy. Great. Absolutely. Um, what are some of the opportunities that the pandemic has opened up for wineries and wine, indus wine industries, Peter? Well, I think the key one is that, um, you know, and, and it's a terrible thing, but just having everybody locked up means that the very first thing that they want to do um, is is get out. And, you know, sitting in somewhere like Canada when you're under lockdown, listening to people in the UK saying we don't know whether hospitality will come back again or not. Well, I don't know why they're wondering all they've got to do is try and book a hotel room in a wine region in Australia and New Zealand right now, and you see how crazy people go um, for getting back out and having those experiences again. So the, the really important thing to do now is to secure relationships with good hospitality people. There are, um, last time I looked, 167 advertisements for chefs in the Hunter Valley region alone and no one can get any applicants. And there's a bit of a funny thing happen where, you know, people have been on support and, uh, you know, they've, they've paused their life and, and a lot of people are asking, why wasn't I working 20 hours a day anyway? <laughs> what was that about? So maybe there might be something else to do. So, you know, it, it's just so important to get ready and to, you know, be able to gear up for that. And, you know, as Canadians understand, I think as well as anyone on earth, it really is all about hospitality and those frontline people. Mm -hmm. Pierre, thank you very much. Very, very insightful. There's a lot of good topic and content and advice that you covered in there. Much appreciate you coming on. Hopefully here. not too much too fast, but <laughs> yeah. Um, cool.
Okay. Goodman Group is a community focused learning and development services provider that works to support professionals, businesses, and entrepreneurs pursuing growth through professional development certificate programs, executive education, and consulting services, as well as startup support. We do have on, on a slide here coming up our wine, uh, wine business management program, which has been launched. This program will take place on Tuesdays and Thursdays in June and will be led by a, a, a community of global leading experts from uh, the wine region of France, such as Sonoma and Burgundy and the Champagne region, uh, the Sonoma area in California and the wine regions of Canada and Australia. You are at the presence of a truly global uh, experts, panel of experts, uh, speaking to the various topics around the business of wine. Early bird pricing of 10% ends this week, so I encourage you to book your few virtual seats that do remain. Funding is also available to some of your organizations, and it could be as much as 80% of the program cost that may be covered. For information on this, do get in touch with the team here at Goodman Group. And there's also group pricing as well as for those who are alums of the university or Goodman Group, you may also connect with us uh, at, at the email provided for inquiries around discounts in there. Well, that is all that we have time for today's session of Business Breeders. Thank you all so very much for tuning in today's session. Joining me next week is Dr. Robin Bourgeois, who will be speaking on warrior women, indigenous women and leadership. I hope many of you can join us then. Until then, stay safe.